Okay? Sige. Uh, good morning, guys. Si, ay, good afternoon pala, no? Sige. Good afternoon, guys. So this is Space Science Lecture Number 2. And today we're going to talk about the sun and its atmosphere and how is it related to our study of the space environments and how it might affect certain uh, certain situations or certain uh, uh, certain aspects of our space weather. Okay, so the outline of our class today is uh, we will start with fun facts and then we're going to have a review on of uh, nuclear fusion, which is one of the uh, the the foremost uh, source of energy coming from the sun, and then we're going to do uh, we're going to focus more on what's happening on the surface of the sun. Okay, so we're going to talk about sunspots and solar activities. We're also going to talk about solar magnetism. It's basically uh, the sun is a ball of plasma. So it is a, it contains uh, it, it contains charged particles that are fluid in nature. Therefore, they are moving and they are uh, they have uh, some form of magnetism. And this magnetic field created by the sun actually affects our own magnetic field. We're also going to look into some special transit. Uh, solar activity, a uh, solar uh, solar uh, phenomenon such as solar flares and corona mass ejections. Okay, so let's have some basic facts. Okay, uh, so the sun is a G-type uh, sun. Basically, it, it it belongs to the main sequence of the uh, of the sun, of the solar uh, characteristics. The distance of the Earth. From the sun is about 1.49 times 10 to the 8 kilometers. So that's about definition of your one astronomical unit. Uh, the distance, that distance is equivalent to about 215 solar radii. So that means if you're going to put in uh, a number of suns, so about 105 suns can fit between the Earth and the sun. And because of that distance, light travels for eight minutes. So the distance in terms of light minutes is about eight. The radius of the sun is 695,700 kilometers and the mass about two times 10 to the 30 kilograms. The gra uh, gravitational uh, acceleration on the surface of the sun is very large because of the, you know, the immense mass of the sun itself at the surface. Uh, a freely falling object, if you can place a object to freely fall on the, on the surface of the sun, it will accelerate with a rate of 2,000, uh, 274 meters per second per second. So therefore, the escape velocity is about 618 kilometers per second, and the mean density is 1,400 kil kilograms per cubic meter. Okay, uh, so its rotation axis is 7.25 to the ecliptic plane, and the rotation about its axis is on the average, okay, it's 25 days. But we already know that uh, different parts of the sun at different latitudes, those portions of the sun are rotating about the axis at different rates. So we call that differential rotation. And that is one of the things or one of the uh, reasons why uh, a solar activity varies. Also, uh, if we're going to look at the composition of the sun, most of it, about 91% of it, is made up of hydrogen. About 9%, uh, about 8.9% is uh, helium, and the rest are your uh, some of the uh, heavier elements. So you have oxygen, carbon, neon, nitrogen, iron, magnesium, silicon, sulfur, etc. Okay, so these are all byproducts of a series of nuclear fusions of different types throughout the sun. And most of this, uh, of, of one of well, most of these elemental uh, particles of elemental elements are can be found in the at the uh, core of the sun, the center of the sun. Okay, so this is the solar structure. 
Uh, so at the center, you have your core, and then at, after that, you have the radiative zone, uh, where it, most of the energy is transferred or heat is transferred by radiation from the Earth's, uh, from the sun's uh, core, which is where your nuclear fusion happens. So the energy coming from the nucleus or the core of the sun is transferred through the radiative zone, through radiation, it's a energy transfer mechanism. And then after the radiative zone, uh, the transfer of energy is done through convection. So there is what we call uh, some convection that is there is a, a flow of plasma uh, in this uh, zone. No? Well, because of this uh, flow of plasma, so there is a series of exchanges between the radiating zone and the surface of the sun. Okay. So at the surface of the sun, we have several things. We have your prominences. Sometimes some people call these flares, but actually there are prominences. We have to distinguish in our work, in, in our, you know, in our context here, we're going to have, we're going to uh, define flares or solar flares in a more special way uh, uh, compared to it prominences. So prominences are the, those uh, tiny filaments at the surface of the sun. Okay, so at the surface of the sun, especially if you're going to look at the first pictures of the solar Parker probe, you're going to have a close up look at the granulation cells, which is you will notice that this, uh, they are continuously moving and that is a consequence of the convective zone. Okay, we also have filaments and flages. We also have some sunspots we're going to talk about later. And then we also have corona holes wherein that is a source of your open field lines. And most of the solar, most of their high speed background solar beam uh, is uh, emanates or uh, emanates. Okay, and also you have your corona loops, which is actually like this is a large prominence, which is which follows the uh, pathway or the direction of the magnetic field lines on the surface of the of the surface of the sun. Okay, but we're going to focus on the surface of the sun and its atmosphere. So, but before that, let's uh, have a brief review of the nuclear fusion, which is the gener energy generator of the sun. So now uh, the energy is generated through several steps. So the first step is this. We have two hydrogen nucleus. Okay, they fuse through, uh, through uh, uh, high energy. They are post-produced and it produces two things. No? It produces a uh, uh, deuterium and when they fuse, uh, and a proton, and then it produces a, a neutrino and an electron. Okay, so this is your neutron and a proton in a uh, deuterium. So this electron can now annihilate, uh, this positron, this is a positron, will annihilate a, a nearby electron. And that annihilation of the positron and electron, which is antimatter of each other, produces energy in a form of gamma radiation. So this is an extremely low probability reaction which, which defines lowness of the hydrogen burning of the stars, as well as the long life of stars. Okay, now most of the collision that happens here are fruitless. Now, either a proton is repelled by a Coulomb electric force, or the proton does not convert into a neutron. Okay, actually, this kind of collision only happens once out of ten to the twenty-five collisions. Okay, so that means on the average, a given proton will get fused into the ethereum uh, in uh, after ten billion years. Okay, so since there are about 10 to, uh, 10 to the 32 protons in one cubic meter, so we still have about uh, one, uh, 10 to the 15 reactions per second in each cubic meter. So in other words, even if this collision rarely happens, but because of the sheer volume of or the sheer number of protons, these are protons, hydrogen nucleus, 
because of the so much uh, because of, there are so many products. So if you go into look at the probability and then you combine it together, there's still a lot of reactions that are happening per second for each cubic meter. Okay, so there's about 10 to the 15 reactions per second. Okay, so this is step two. So this produces a deuterium. And then of course there are some, they're still uh, roaming around some protons around it. So step is that that deuterium fuses with another proton produces, that produces a uh, helium uh, nucleus. And from here, gener uh, energy is also generated. So in fact, the total energy released in synthesizing for helium atom, okay, so that's a combination of these two. This is step three, by the way. Okay, if there are two helium atoms that are fused together to form this helium atom, it's about 26 0.73 mega electrons. Okay, so this again this is a summary of your uh, of the usual nuclear fusion that happens uh, at the core of the, the core of the sun. Okay, so it starts with a pair of protons, then this proton will produce a uh, deuterium atom or deuterium nucleus, produces a neutrino and a positron. Okay, so this deuterium fuses with another proton, produces a helium, helium isotope with three atomic uh, number. And then it fuses with the, the same uh, helium, produces a uh, helium atom, okay? A stable helium atom, okay? So this is your nuclear, nuclear helium. Now we can, uh, uh, when we observe the sun, we can observe it using different eyes. So different eyes means the, the sensors that we're going to look at are detecting several, uh, at different frequencies of light or wavelengths of light. So this image shows you the different pictures of the same sun at the same time at different eyes. So this corresponds to six different wavelengths uh, at the, uh, 171 angstrom. So this is, uh, angstrom is 10 to the negative 10 meters. So in terms of nanometers, which I think you're more familiar with, this is 17.1 uh, nanometers. So this is actually in the ultraviolet region, okay? And some of them will be in the X-ray region already. Okay, so this is in the UV X-ray region. So this is uh, 995 angstrom or 19.5 nanometers. This is 28.4 angstrom or 28.4 nanometers. This is 30.4 nanometers, 94, 9.4 nanometers and 13.1 and nanometers. And as you can see at different wavelengths, you can see the sun at a different perspective. Okay, so different wavelengths will give you a different sense of what is happening in the, on, the, on the surface of the sun. So for example, if you're going to look at this 195 Armstrong wavelength or field, you will see that there are light spots that are brighter bright spots and there are uh, dark areas. Okay, so as we're going to talk about later, these dark areas are, is where, you can, uh, is where your corona holes are. Okay, and these bright regions are where the sunspots are located. If we're going to look at the sun in the visible region, this sunspot will appear dark because the, because the surface of the sun at the visible wavelength is so bright that it actually, uh, the, the, brightness of the, so, the, the brightness of your sunspot fails in comparison with the background, uh, with the background, uh, solar radiation or solar intensity or luminosity, okay? Now, as you will notice also that at different wavelengths, the corona holes is not that obvious, okay? And then there are, the surface of the sun is more obvious in these regions, 195, 100, but in the out, uh, uh, higher wavelengths or longer wavelengths, okay, this, uh, these features of the sun is not that, uh, cannot be seen uh, obviously or uh, apparent, uh, in, a more, in a more apparent way, 
at this wavelengths. Okay. So when you look at the sun, you're going to look at the sun at different wavelengths. That will also give you a different sense or different uh different information about the sun. Okay. By the way, these images are are obtained from the GO16 satellite. So the GO just a just a trivia about the GO satellite. So this GO satellite is actually the same geosynchronous satellite that is also facing the Earth. So the GO satellite is also a weather satellite. So it has it, it basically looks at two directions. It, it, it's, it looks at the direction of the sun where we can see this thing. So this has, it is a solar observatory. And it also an uh, Earth observing satellite that can, can see patterns within the surface of the Earth that can see you know, typhoons and all those things. Okay, but Go 16 is not the only observatory or solar observatory that we use. We also have SOHO and we also have SDO. We also have Minodis uh, spacecraft. So those, all those spacecrafts and other, uh, other spacecrafts can determine or can observe the sun at, uh, uh, at different uh, wavelengths as well as in, at, uh, especially with different uh, information that we want to uh, that we want to obtain. Question po, sir. Yes. Sir, di ba po since observatory siya, uh, kaya niya bang makuha yung UV, ano niya, uh, wavelength ng UV? Uh, or actually, through satellite yes. siya? Actually, uh, yes. Uh, the, the UV, uh, but uh, it depends on, ano, no? it depends on the payload that the spacecraft is, no? So does it, uh, so you can look at the information about the payload of these spacecrafts so in order for you to know kung kaya niya mag-detect ng UV. Okay? So, hindi siya continuous spec siya in a sense na all wavelengths can be available can, can, are available to be observed, no? So, there are only specific wavelengths that these uh, satellites or spacecrafts can actually uh, observe. Okay, so yeah, it, uh, so different uh, spacecrafts you know, have different sets of uh, wavelengths that they can detect. Okay, so hindi siya continue. Okay po siya, di bali po, uh, galing po siya sa spacecraft, pero hindi po siya mismo sa observatory dito sa Earth Station? No, no, no. These are all spacecraft uh, pic, uh, uh, okay, pa. are all spacecraft uh, images, okay? So because we cannot, uh, 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 if we're going to look at this, uh, this uh, information or this uh, videos, these are our these are all uh, spacecraft images. SOHO, SDO, uh, Solar Dynamics Observatory, SOHO, Inode, and GO16. These are all inform. Uh, these are all spacecrafts. So they get data from the surface of the uh, uh, outside Earth at a specific. Uh, at specific uh, points around the sun. Okay? Uh, di bali po sir, uh, last question po sir. Uh, di bali iba-ibang spacecraft po, iba-ibang wavelengths yung dinitetect niya? Uh, uh, it's, uh, okay. So this six uh, uh, is obtained by one spacecraft lang. May go satellite. So it will happen that there will be times na yung different spacecrafts will have common wavelengths that they ano, ano, that they have a common wavelengths that they can observe uh, observe uh, data or observe the sun no. Nakuha mo ba? Apo okay po sir. Okay. So in other words, okay, if you're going to observe the sun, uh, depende kung anong wavelength gusto mo no. Depending on the wavelength you uh, want, you can look at different, ano, different uh, uh, kinds of spacecraft that are available. Okay, so later I will show you, no, if uh, uh, pictures coming from uh, coming from the Hinode, ay, so coming from Soho, as well as in, ano, as well as from SDO. Okay. Okay na tayo? Yes po, sir. Thank you po. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Sige. 
Okay. Uh, sige. So, okay. Sige. By the way, no, if we're going to look at SUV, this is actually, usually when this is, uh, when pictures of the sun are, are published, so usually meron niyang nakasulat na tatlong information. What is the satellite? Or what is the spacecraft? In this case, the spacecraft is the GO-16 satellite. And then the wavelength. And then this one is the instrument. So this is the payload. So SUVI is actually solar ultraviolet imager. Okay, so these are actually extreme UV to mga. Sometimes extreme. So this one is X-ray, I think, the lower wavelengths. So it's, about, it's around the, the extreme UV X-ray bands, no? Okay, so uh, for example, yung SDO naman, uh, iba naman yung set of wavelengths niya, but I think meron siyang 195 amps from the, the, the sensor. Okay? See. Now, let's look at the sunspots. Okay, uh, so sunspots, uh, okay, this one is the uh, picture of the sun, solar disks, on January 6, 20, uh, 2014. So this is uh, obtained by SDO, Solar Dynamics Observatory. HMI is a is the sensor. Uh, I think this is a uh, imager to imager. I'm not really, I'm not I'm not exactly sure any HM, but it is a I uh, know it is one of the payloads of the Solar uh, Solar Dynamics Observatory. So this is in January six. Okay, so this is what uh, this is what the uh, sun looks like. So this are uh, these dark spots. You can see inside the This is a visible range, a uh, uh, picture of the sun. So uh, the the brightness of the sun spot actually pales in comparison with the solar atmosphere. So that's why they look uh, they look dark. So that's why they're called sun spots. Okay. So sun spots are 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 usually called active regions. Okay, and the active regions are named, okay, as they appear in the solar disk. So you will notice here, for example, uh, when saying uh, 1942, this is 1943, this is 1944, this is 1946, this is 1945. So that means 1942 actually appeared first than 1943. 1944, 1946, etc. Okay. Now, just to give you a, 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 a just give you some context now in terms of size. This is the size of the Jupiter compared to the Sun. This is the size of the Earth. So you will notice that this sunspot, 1944 sunspot number or active region. That's why sometimes this is identified as AR1944 because this is active region 1944. So uh, this is much, much bigger than this, uh, the, the size of the Earth. And in fact, this is so large. This is a close-up view of this sunspot. This is so large that it was observed on the Earth by the naked eye. Okay? Sobrang laki niya, kitang kita siya, even without using a telescope. That's how big this sunspot is in January uh, 2014. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, the sunspots actually uh, rotate with the solar with, with with the sun. Okay, and these are actually markers. Sunspots are used to be markers, are used as markers to determine the rotational period of each latitude of the sun. If you're going to track this you will notice that the equator rotates faster than the higher altitudes. We call this the differential rotation, okay? And the differential rotation can actually be described by an empirical equation given by omega. This is rotational speed, and this is equal to uh, A plus B sine squared P plus C sine to the fourth P. This is an empirical formula or the, this is an empirical equation, where in this coefficients, A, B, and C, are determined experimentally by tracking the movement of the sunspots. Okay? So from here, so uh, these coefficients are in degrees by day. 
but this is in degrees per day. Okay, so from Snowgrass and Ulrich in 1990, these are the current coefficients used to estimate the differential rotation of the sun. Okay, so by using this equation, uh, near the equator, the sun rotates 25 days, and near the the near the poles, it rotates at about 35 days. So there's a differential rotation. Okay, which we're going to talk about any consequence of differential rotation. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, an active region of the sun is an area with a specifically uh, or especially strong magnetic field. That's why it's called active region. No? The sunspot frequently form active regions, and these active regions appear to be bright in X ray and ultraviolet images. That's why. In this image, which are UV and X-ray, those sunspots are bright. So in other words, they emit this frequency of light, UVN, uh, UVN X-ray, uh, uh, with high intensity. Okay? Okay, so in terms of solar activity, uh, the solar activity actually uh, uh, are often associated with uh, solar flares and coronal mass ejection, which we're going to talk about here. So in other words, uh, solar activity, which is associated with active regions, okay, are more frequent, uh, are, are, is higher at a specific, a specific years. And during those years, okay, these active regions are more, uh, are very frequent in terms of appearance. And therefore, uh, sol uh, uh, occurrences of solar flares and CMEs are, uh, are higher in, uh, in number. Okay, we should go to talk about again later. Okay, just to give you, now, just to give you a, a, a context again. So these are the, uh, these are the sunspots now. Okay, if we're going to look at the UV, it would look like this. Okay, so this is your sunspot, 1944, 1946, look at this too. And maybe this group of sunspots here or active regions. Okay, so these are the regions, okay? So this is the uh, image of the sun at a UV, uh, UV frequency, okay? Now, because of the differential rotation of the sun, okay, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know the the uh, magnetic activity of the sun and the rotation of the sun and how the magnetic field uh, changes throughout time. When sunspots are when these sunspots are mapped as a function of time and latitude, actually there is some form of a pattern. We call it uh, a butterfly pattern. So throughout the years, okay, when the uh, sunspot areas are average over individual solar rotations. Okay, at different times of the year, this uh, this is the uh, no, no, this is the uh, this is the uh, latitude the solar latitude. Okay, so you will notice that uh, during the the sunspots are formed usually at the mid latitudes. And then they progress towards the equator. So that's one of, uh, one of the reasons for that is again the differential rotation because the uh, the surface of the sun rotates faster than the equator. So that means uh, this uh, whatever is here will eventually move towards the equator. And once they do that, they go they rotate faster. Okay, that's why. Uh, this for this is uh, this pattern is for okay so this is for the northern uh, northern hemisphere of the sun and this is for the southern hemisphere of the sun. okay now this actually corresponds to the 11 year cycle this is the average daily sunspot area okay so this is the number of uh, uh, how many uh, percent of the visible hemisphere is occupied by sunspots. Okay, and you will notice that there is a pattern 
and this pattern corresponds to your solar cycle. Okay, so today, uh, right now, a few, uh, in December 2019, the last solar cycle, the last completed solar cycle, uh, that solar cycle 24. Okay, now we are already, we are officially at solar cycle 26, uh, 25. Okay, so this is the average daily sunspot area. So basically, this tells you how much area does the, does the sunspots uh, occupy your, you know, the, the solar disk. Okay, and that is one uh, parameter that we use to uh, look at solar activity. Okay, another proxy, uh, another parameter, proxy parameter uh, that we use to determine how active the sun is, is the sunspot number or, or SSN. Okay, so the relative sunspot number. It's actually given by this equation, okay? But the point is that this basically tells you how much uh, the, uh, the, the uh, how many how many sunspots or uh, how many active regions are present in a certain at a, at a certain time, okay? So this is your uh, the blue graph is the monthly sunspot number, the red graph is the smooth or the average. I think this is a moving average of the sunspot number. Okay, so you will notice there since 1980, since 24, 25, 26, 27. So since the solar cycle uh, 21, the solar cycles are appear to be decreasing in magnitude. Okay, so uh, for the past four solar cycles, the sun appears to be less active even during the its solar maximum re, uh, solar maximum period. No, so you will notice there that at the uh, for for example at solar cycle twenty one, which is one of the highest so far, it's a solar cycle twenty one. This one, okay. Uh, the uh, the the mid midway between solar max and solar minimum of this solar cycle, okay represented by this all, uh, sunspot number is actually still ab around the, is already the maximum for uh, for the last, or maximum of the last solar cycle 24. And it mm -hmm. appears that the forecast for the next solar cycle, solar cycle 25, the, we also, we, we also have a, you know, a le a lower, uh, a less active sun for the next, uh, let's say, 11, 11 years. No? Okay, so by the way, this the, the solar cycle is about 11, 20, uh, 11 to 12 years solar cycle. Okay, just to give you an idea, uh, if we're going to look at the, again, this is a picture of the sun. This is coming from SDO, Solar Dynamics Observatory. Uh, the payload is AIA. The frequency is... Uh, 190, uh, the wavelength is 193 angstrom. Okay, so the picture here is 2010. So this is a solar minimum. May 21, this is 2014, July 1. So this is 2010, 11, uh, this is by, by two, no? So 2012, 2014. So this is solar maximum. So you will notice that there are more active regions during solar maximum than solar minimum. In 2018, we, also, we already are in the solar maximum, solar minimum. So you see less, uh, less uh, sunspots. Okay. Uh, so just to give you again an idea, if we're going to look at the uh, pictures of the suns, picture of the sun at different times, for the past two solar cycles, so this is the last two solar cycles. So I take a picture here. So from 1996 to 2018. Okay. So uh, in connection to this, this will be your first uh, homework for today. So make the same figure using sunspot number. So you're going to use the same plot, this sol, uh, uh, same sun, uh, sorry. You're going to make this figure sunspot number as a function of year, okay? And F10.7 solar flux, which we're going to talk about later, okay? During your birthday, kung kailan may yung birthday nyo, 
from 1996 to 2020, to, to this year. So, di pa ay nag birthday this year hanggang 2019. Okay? So, again, that's the first part of this homework. The second part of this homework is you're going to produce the same figure like this. Hindi naman kailangan pabilog, no? That doesn't necessarily mean that it looks like this. But you have to collect uh, solar disk images from the Solar Dynamics Observatory using the Atmospheric Imaging Assembly. So that's STOAIA with wavelet 193 uh, for your birthday again, but this time only from 2009 to 2020 or 20 mm -hmm. earliest, whatever is the earliest, okay? So right now you can just use the pictures from the archives at the spaceweatherlive.com, okay? So you just have to put in, for example, the solar disk for uh, 11 years, 29, 2009 or 2010 for the earliest to 2020, okay, for the solar disk. And then for the sunspot number or solar flux, we could also look at the archive of the spaceweatherlive.com. So you just explore this website, okay? For a quick information about the sun, space weather, you can actually go to Space Weather Lab, okay? So they have an archive as early as 20, uh, 1996. So for the past two solar cycles. But if you want to have a challenge, okay? If you feel like taking on the challenge, uh, instead of uh, using the spaceweatherlive.com uh, pictures, you can go to this website that's virtualsolar.org and you're going to do this same picture Okay, for two solar cycles, this time for using SOHO Extreme Ultraviolet Imaging Telescope, EIT, using any wavelet. Okay, using any, using any wavelet. Okay, so this is the source of the data. So virtual solar. Okay. So this is a picture of SDOAIA at 113, 131 angstrom, and at 193 angstrom mm -hmm. uh, two days ago. So this is uh, October 22, a few days ago. So there's already an active region right now. So this is actually one of the thing, the one of the you know one of the reasons why the uh, space weather panel formed by NASA and NOAA declared that we are already at the start of the new solar cycle because these uh, active regions are becoming more frequent as we go along, uh, as time progresses, okay? So just to take note again, so this time is actually UD time. So this is uh, universal time, coordinated time. So 1455, 56 means as 14 UT. Uh, in our context, if you want to know 14 UT, what is 14 UT, you just add eight, eight hours. So that's 22 UT. So that's about 23, uh, 23 local time. So 23 local time, so that's 11, P, uh, 11 PM local time. This is how the sun looks like facing the earth. Okay. So as you will notice again, this is uh, 131. Uh, angstrom and this is 193 angstrom. Usually we use 193 angstrom to look at uh, solar corona or corona holes. These are corona holes, which we're going to talk about a bit later. Okay, so as I mentioned before, I want you to also plot F10.7 solar flux. So what is F10.7 solar flux? So F10.7 F10 solar flux is actually radio frequency, okay? These are radio emissions, okay? So the solar flux at 10.7 centimeters, okay? So that means it's about 2,800 megahertz frequency. This is an excellent indicator of solar activity. This is uh, this uh, solar flux at 10.7 is often called as F10.7. And it is one of the longest records of solar activity. Okay, uh, so this index is actually a solar index. F10.7 radio emissions originate, originates height in the chromosphere 
and low in corona atmosphere. This index correlates well with the sunspot number as shown in the figure. Uh, so while this solar radio flux is in the radio frequency in the, in the electromagnetic spectrum, sunspot number correlates very well with ultraviolet regions. Okay. So that means that the more active the sun is, the more solar, uh, the more radio, the more radio waves it emits, and uh, the more UV radiation it emits. And of course, uh, naturally, it also emits more visible solar radiance. Okay. Uh, so this is an example of solar irradiance. So this is in the visible spectrum. This is in watts per square meter. Solar radiance actually have uh, follows the eleven year cycle. And it follows the eleven year uh, cycle, uh, uh, just like your sunspot number and uh, and uh, radio flux, right? F ten point zero. Okay. So in other words, uh, what what I'm trying to say here is that. We have different ways to, uh, no, no, to express uh, solar activity, which is very important in the study of space weather. We're already, you know, we're already, we're still at the solar minimum, but uh, the but because of the announcements, it has been uh, already set that the sun can, uh, will now start to increase in its activity. Okay. So that means more danger, more uh, more hazards will be you know, will be uh, will be apparent, especially for our uh, space assets on orbit. Okay. Now, some people say that you know some skeptics say that um, um, the solar activity actually dictates climate. Okay, to some extent, see, to some extent, yes, no. As you will notice in this figure, okay. As you will notice in this figure, uh, there are already uh, several uh, periods of time that were specially identified. So right now we are in the modern maximum, but in the 1800s we have observed a doubtful minimum, which some scientists say that. It looks like we are approaching with uh, another Dalton minimum somewhere here because of the apparent, you know, apparent trend of activity per, uh, per solar cycle. So decreasing activity per solar cycle. But in the 1600s, even the 1970s, uh, 1700s, there is a few observed solar activity, uh, solar activity in terms of sun, sunspot number. And it coincides with the fact that during this time, okay, there was a uh, there was a mini ice age during this time, especially in the uh, in the in the polar regions or in the higher latitude regions. Okay, it, it also happens in, in this uh, delta minimum. There were uh, the during this time there were recorded you know extended uh, winter times, especially in Europe, in Canada, and the United States. Okay. And they say that it's it might happen again here. However, okay, as mentioned by NASA, uh, this is another picture of that. Uh, they, they they try to correlate uh, uh, solar activity in terms of total solar radiance and temperature. Okay, so so uh, surface temperature. So you will notice here that during the 1880s up to about 1950s. The general trends of solar radiation, uh, solar radiance, is followed by your uh, surface temperature. These are this is anomaly from the ano uh, anomaly from the uh, average. No? but the point is that if uh, the solar solar radiance mostly uh, uh, dictates the surface temperature of the Earth. But after 1950s, even though the solar activity decreases, as you will notice, even the solar radiance coming from the sun decreases, 
the increase in temperature did not follow that. So there must be other factors that uh, affect this rising temperature. Okay, and some people say, or most people say that this is because of your greenhouse gases. Okay, and you know, and so, so that's it. So that's one of the, one of the definitive, uh, uh, one of the definitive uh, results or information that uh, solar activity, yes, it has an effect on climate, but as of the moment, its effect is very minimal uh, compared to uh, the other factors like anthrop anthropogenic factors, okay? So as I mentioned again uh, a while ago, okay, there, uh, there was a news a few months, uh, last month, wherein they officially, uh, NASA and NOAA, so by the way, NASA, of course, you already know NASA, NOAA is the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. It's equivalent to PAC-ASA in the Philippines. So they are actually already, uh, the Solar Cycle 25 panel already officially announced the commencement of the new solar cycle. And it started in, uh, in December 2019. So this marks the new solar cycle. Uh, so, so starting from this point forward, uh, the occurrences of sunspots uh, and, in, and the total irradiance as well as radio flux will definitely start to increase from now on. Okay, so the hazards that solar activity brings to our solar uh, space assets will also increase in nature. Okay, but it is predicted that again uh, the this current solar cycle will be below average, just like the previous solar cycle. However, it doesn't mean okay, it doesn't mean that there is no risk of extreme space weather. While the number of extreme space weather uh, is dictated by the solar activity, but the magnitude of those activities or those, uh, those events uh, uh, does not follow the actual activity of the sun. So it may happen that extreme, weather, uh, extreme space weather events may happen actually even in solar minimum area. In fact, two, two years ago, uh, three years ago, 2017, uh, which is our actually 2017, if we're going to go back here, 2017 is still about, it's a solar minimum, uh, solar minimum year. Okay, 2017. However, during 2017 and September 2017, that was the day or that was the month where in the largest solar flare event during this total, during this full solar cycle 24 happened. Okay, so you will not imagine, oh, even if the solar activity is very low, okay, the, uh, especially for example in solar cycle 24, that is where the largest solar uh, largest solar flare happened. It's an X uh, X nine point three solar flare. So we're going to talk about that later. Okay. Okay. So that means that uh, we have to really still uh, have to study and monitor the current uh, space weather uh, uh, or solar cycle or uh, the activities in the sun. Okay, now, as you will notice, as I mentioned before, there are more sunspots that happens during solar maximum than in solar minimum. Okay, so what happens now if you have a solar minimum? Okay, one of the, one of the things that we need to look at first is the solar corona. So the solar corona uh, is the, uh, the basically uh, uh, has a, is, is a, it contains hot gas, and it streams gases, no? Uh, hot, hot, uh, hot plasma. So it contains extremely hot plasma. Okay, so you already know plasma temperature, no? So the, 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 the solar corona is about 10 million Kelvin. Okay, but uh, about 10 to the negative 12 de less dense than the protosphere gas. 
Okay? So this is a corona graph. Okay? And you will see more obviously uh, this uh, the solar corona. This happened during a total solar eclipse. So what's important about solar corona is that we have in the solar corona, it emits x-rays. Okay? Uh, and for less, uh, for for solar minimum times or years with solar minimum, uh, the corona holes are more evident than solar uh, than sunspots. Okay, so this is uh, the image corresponds to an electronic transition of highly ionized iron. Uh, so iron strip of its thirteen of its electron. So the point is that this dark region, okay, are sort of windows of high speed solar wind. Okay, so normally solar wind is emanated through the corona, but once there is a corona hole, it opens up uh, higher uh, solar wind that are higher in, in speeds. No? Okay, and this is very important uh, because during solar minimum, this is the major driver of solar weather. Okay, so during solar minimum, we, we instead of looking at solar uh, at active regions or sunspots, we look at corona holes. Okay, so that's why uh, there are you know there are enthusiasts or websites that actually monitors. I look at solar corona. So just to give an idea, okay, I will. Uh, uh, this is a tweet. Uh, around the same around the same day, one year apart. So the left side is September 25. So that's month, uh, September 25, one year ago. And this is September 26, last month. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you will notice that, uh, uh, that, that, that the tweet says that there is a trans-equatorial corona hole facing the, facing the Earth. So if, if this is the case so around, so the enhanced solar wind, as I mentioned earlier, could arrive in about three days. So whatever this solar wind will bring, uh, will bring forth to the to the, to the space environment of the Earth, it will arrive at approximately three days. Okay, so last month, uh, same thing happened. So a trans-equatorial corona hole facing facing uh, spacing Earth, enhanced solar wind could arrive in around three days. Okay, so you will notice also here that most of the solar corona happens at the Earth. Uh, the solar uh, solar poles, but sometimes this could also appear along the equator. Okay, and this always facing the Earth. So this is your background solar. Okay, so this picture shows the relative speeds of solar wind. Okay, for example, uh, uh, at a typical example, no? so solar wind is a stream of energized charged particle flowing outward from the sun, usually at the speeds of about, uh, about, you know, about 500, 300 kilometers per second to can be as, as fast as about 900 kilometers per second. Okay, so this is very, very fast, okay? So if we're going to look at this corona graph, they, we, they, the, this uh, group superimposed the solar wind at different latitudes around the sun. Okay, so this is your corona. This is your corona hole. And you, in the corona hole, you will see high-speed solar wind stream. And near the equator, uh, the, uh, the solar wind is not that fast. Okay, later I'll show you some important data now. So this is another example. This is an example of a solar wind data. The, scrape, the spacecraft that is used here is ACE. So ACE is one of the two uh, spacecrafts that measure solar wind. Another, uh, another, uh, another spacecraft that, uh, that we use is Discover Satellite. I'm going to show you uh, a latest uh, data from, uh, from, from Discover spacecraft later on. Okay, so the, how do we read this? Okay, uh, so this is space, uh, ACE. Uh, this is real-time solar wind, so RTSW, that's real-time solar wind data. Using MAG, 
mag is the one of the payloads of ACE and SWEPAM. SWEPAM is the solar wind, electron, proton, and alpha monitor. Okay, so the mag actually gives you the interplanetary magnetic field B total, BZ, and P. This is the angle or the direction of your magnetic field. BT is the total magnetic field. BZ, which is more, which is very important when uh, to uh, very important in uh, in determining whether there will be a you know geomagnetic storm or not. So that's BZ. So these two panels is provided by MAG. And the next three panels is provided by SWEPAM, our solar wind, electron, proton, and alpha monitor. Okay, so this, uh, the third panel is density. So this is your ion density. Okay, so you're familiar with density already. You know, and this is a plasma parameter. So, uh, the fourth panel is speed. So this is solar wind speed. Sometimes we call it bulk speed. So that's the uh, the speed of the of the plasma of the solar wind as it moves together. Okay, so this is bulk speed. So you will notice that the speed of the solar wind from October 16 to October 22 UT. So a few days ago, two days ago. Okay, it's about 300 to 400 kilometers per second. So about the average, okay? And then you will notice that the BZ is about, you know, typically, uh, no, no, uh, there's no component along the Z. So it's neither pointing upward or pointing northward or southward relative to the Earth's magnetic field or uh, rotational axis. Okay, so here we expect that there is no, I don't know, there's no, um, there's no geomagnetic storm that will happen or the, there will be no aurora that will occur in the, in the poles. The last panel is iron temperature. So that's the temperature of the plasma contained in the solar wind. Okay, so the, just a few, uh, no, no, just a few things that I need to mention here. Uh, this is, uh, the, the, the figure here is determined by ACE. So this is Advanced Composition Explorer. And this was launched in 1997. And since 1998, it has provided uh, everybody uh, uh, real-time solar wind information, which is very important in the uh, in the prediction in, in uh, space weather forecasting. Now, speaking of space weather forecasting, okay. So, given this, you know, information, okay, uh, there are there is a specific model that was invented a few years ago, wherein if there is an event happened in the, in the sun, okay, uh, we there uh, using several physics uh, uh, physics uh, uh, physics theories or physics based theories, uh, the, the the plasma that this contains, even uh, solar wind or uh, CME, uh, we were able we can uh, we can actually predict in a very uh, highly accurate manner when and how this uh, high speed stream actually can actually hit the earth okay so this is an example of that okay so this is what we call a wang shili arge arge enlil uh, model or wsa enlil model so this is a large scale physics based prediction model of the heliosphere this is used by the Space Weather Prediction Center. It can provide up to four days of advanced warning of solar wind structures and even Earth-directed corona mass ejections that causes geomagnetic storm. Okay, so this panel shows you the following. No? So there are two pa uh, general panels: the upper panel and lower panel. The upper panel shows you the plasma density. Okay, so this is the same density as this one. And the lower panel shows you the radial velocity. So how fast the solar wind is. Okay, uh, this circle is the picture of the heliosphere in the ecliptic. So imagine you are looking 
from the pole of the sun. So you're looking at from above. This two pic this, uh, there are three dots here. This is the earth. Okay, the green dot is the earth. Uh, there are two spacecraft located at the specific Lagrangian points in the Earth's orbit, uh, stereo A and stereo B. So this is stereo A and stereo B. So these are side looking spacecrafts that monitors the sun. Okay, uh, just to give you an idea, uh, Okay, just to give you an idea, so this is plasma density. So blue means low plasma density, red means higher plasma density, white is higher, black is highest. So that means this solar wind, a bucket, uh, so you will notice that it is uh, actually, I don't know, uh, it's not uh, propagating radially outward, but it actually curves like this, no? And that's because of the rotation of the sun. So because of the angular momentum of the sun, this solar wind is actually curving like this. Okay, so the point is that this is the path that the solar wind passes through. So this is the path where there is the, the solar wind because the, this solar wind is directed everywhere, no? So this solar wind is actually a high density solar wind. This high density solar wind. This is low density solar wind. This figure, is actually, if you're going to look at the side of the sun, so this is north part of the earth, this is earth, this is south part, okay? So this is plasma density. Now, if you're going to look at this area, at this area, this is radial wind, okay? So blue means low velocity, red is high velocity, orange is high velocity, white and black are highest velocities. So this area, is actually a low, as low solar wind, okay? And this area has high solar wind. So this is high solar wind. Now this line, okay, is a marker for this picture. Okay, if I play this video, what will happen is that this will move, okay? Like this, oh, okay. So you will notice there that the plasma density is high because uh, at this time, so the starting time is uh, 1019, no? uh, five days ago. So this is the, earth, uh, the, the plasma density that hit Earth is high. That's why there is a high solar wind, uh, there is a high plasma density. But the solar wind is low given by this area. Okay, so if you play this, you will notice that uh, this solar wind will actually pass by the earth somewhere at the 24th. So we expect around today that the solar wind velocity will be high. It will start to increase, but the density will start to decrease. Okay, let's play it like that. So at, okay, at uh, October 24 today, so the solar wind, this high, high stream solar wind will start to heat the earth so that it, this is where we can expect a high solar wind. Uh, uh, this can affect, uh, of course, it depends on the direction of the magnetic field. Okay, if we're going to look at this, so during this time, this high speed solar wind will actually heat earth already. It will pick at around uh, tomorrow. No? So we expect that right now we are already experiencing geomagnetic storm, provided that the IMF or the interplanetary magnetic field that this solar wind carries all also points south southward. Okay, so let me let me repeat that again. So this is one way to forecast uh, solar wind. So later I will show you again what happens if there is a coronal mass ejection. Okay, which is very much much cooler than this one. Okay, so speaking of uh, IMF, so IMF is the magnetic field carried by the solar wind. Now, for for active regions or for sunspot, it looks something like this. Now, this is a magnetogram. Okay, so this is another picture of the Earth of the sun. 
uh, that uh, analyzes the poles of the sun. So the point here is that uh, so sunspots are actually made up of north and south pole. So the black and the white one just tells us that these two are oppositely, that the poles of this magnet, uh, the poles of the, uh, the, the magnetic poles here are opposite with each other. Okay, so it's a good idea, no? Okay, so this is uh, January 1, 20, uh, January 7, 2014. Uh, this one is now. Uh, okay, solar magnetism. So the solar magnetism actually are very much related to the sunspots. So that's why sunspots are it's a parameter that is used to I don't know to to uh, to determine solar activity because more sunspots means there are more magnetic field lines emanating from the from the sun because these are actually large sources of magnetic fields, okay? So just like a horseshoe magnet, one is south pole and the other one is a north pole, okay? And this is what, uh, this is a picture of the sun, again, AIA SDO 193, and they superimpose uh, uh, solar magnetism or uh, magnetic field lines uh, from the sun. So you will notice that the magnetic field lines emanate from the Sunspots. Okay, this is this actual uh, this is an actual example of the magnetic field lines. These are not magnetic field lines per se, but these are plasma trapped in the magnetic field lines. So remember our discussion in our basic plasma physics that plasma are can uh, are 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 trapped. Okay, along the magnetic field lines. So this so the plasma that we detect are actually along the magnetic field line so that we can actually uh, observe magnetic field lines in this case. So these are magnetic field lines, okay? Followed by your, by the plasma contained in this magnetic field lines, okay? And this is actually, uh, these sunspots actually emanate from the convection sites, okay? Uh, while the sunspots are very dark in nature compared to the, so solar atmosphere, solar surface, it is a still very hot. No? Sunspots are around 4,500 Kelvin temperature. While, of course, the other parts or the, the background part, it's about 8,500 nanometers uh, kel uh, Kelvin. Okay, so these are just some complicated, uh, no, no, some complicated uh, solar magnetism. So we have large scale magnetic field lines and we have low. Uh, low scale magnetic field lines. Okay, there are also close magnetic field lines that are happening. Okay, in this area, but in the corona holes, because that is where high speed solar wind are passing through, the corona holes are actually areas of open field lines. Okay, pero sir, the ba sabi nyo, magnetic field lines do not are uh, always form closed loops. So, in other words, these open field lines are actually closing with the e, with the IMF. Okay, so this is just a, a little bit of a cartoon of how magnetic field lines emanate. Okay, now if there is uh, if the sun is becoming more active, okay, so that means there are more sunspots. Sunspots are measures of magnetic activity. Now, if this magnetic activity it becomes very large. Okay, there are several things that happen. Number one is uh, solar flares can happen and coronal mass ejection may also happen. Okay, so solar flares are actually bursts of X-ray. Okay, because remember that so, uh, these areas on the sun emits a lot of X-ray. But if suddenly there is a big burst of re release of energy, and that energy uh, is emanated by X-ray, okay? We call that the solar flare. So that means we also, uh, we actually, uh, uh, in order to monitor solar flares, we have to look at the sun in the X-ray region, 
because that because that's that's the that's the EM spectrum that is most evident during a solar flare. Later, I will show you a picture of that. But because this X-ray uh, this X-ray is electromagnetic in nature, so that means the effect of this, okay, will travel at the speed of light. So usually it takes about eight minutes to reach Earth. So almost instant. If there's a solar flare happened at the sun, and it happens to be Earth facing. That effect can uh, that effect can uh, be experienced within eight minutes. However, if you have a coronal mass ejection like this, okay, these are giant clouds of particles. Okay, because this is carried by the solar wind. Solar wind is much slower than speed of light. Okay, they can reach to about three, one to three days. Okay, so in fact. CMEs actually accelerate the background solar wind, okay, to, to speeds of about 700 kilometers per second, 600 kilometers per second. And they are being monitored by the A satellite or the Discover satellite. So this is one picture of a, sol, uh, of a CMP. This is another CMP. This is a LASCO image. This is a coronagraph. So you will notice that uh, you, uh, there is a big flare, a uh, big ejection there very very swift no in that context so it's a really a big explosion this happened in march 15 2015 okay uh, so this is actually this is a big solar storm and it caused a large geomagnetic storm in this current solar cycle we call that the saint patrick's geomagnetic storm because it happened the geomagnetic storm happened in St. Patrick's Day. Okay, there are other famous geomagnetic storm. There was a Halloween, Halloween storm in the 1990s, in the 2000s, because they happened in the, in, during Halloween. So they, they, we call it Halloween geomagnetic storm. Okay, I also mentioned last time in 2017, there was a large solar flare. So this is a picture of the solar flare. So the solar flare originated in active region 2673, located at the southeast portion or southeast quadrant of the sun facing the earth. Okay, so this is the picture of the sun at the SDAAIA 171 angstrom. Okay, so you will notice here that there is a big, you know, that the big flash of X-ray. So this is X-ray. Okay, so this is another picture of that sun. So you will notice that because of that, you know, big flare, big flash of UV, uh, of, uh, of, of X-ray. So this is X-ray. The sensor is actually uh, becomes noisy. Okay, so there is uh, the, 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 the sensor receive a lot of UV radiation, uh, X-ray radiation that more than it can handle. That's why it becomes very noisy during that time. Okay, now this X-ray is act, the, the X-ray emission of the sun is being uh, monitored by the GO satellite. So this is X-ray flux. So this is X-ray flux in watts per square meter, and this is time. This is the actual data of this current, of this specific solar flare. Okay, now this happened at uh, uh, September 6, no? so this is September 6. So there are, you will notice that there are two, there are two bright, there are two flashes, that's one, and the second one. So again, there are two big flashes, that's one, and the second flash. So those two flashes are already are seen here. So this is the first flash. This is already an X, I think that's an X, uh, X2 something flare. And the next one would, is the largest of them all. That's a solar flare 9.3. So that's X. So just like, uh, just like storms, so this is actually a, a type of a solar storm, just like typhoons, wherein we categorize typhoons in terms of their speed, uh, wind speed. So you have the tropical depression, you have tropical storm, um, typhoon, etc. Okay, we can all we in this case we use uh, the X-ray flux to categorize these flares. 
So basically, they are categorized uh, five ways. So A, B, C, then M, and then X. And these are the range of particle flux. This is watts per square meter. Okay. Usually, the background solar wind has an X-ray flux of about 10 to the negative 6 and below. So A and B are, are, are considered to be background solar flux. But when it reaches C, so that solar flux is usually associated with active regions. Okay, so this is how we categorize solar flux. Okay, so to give you a, a very brief statistic of, uh, of how many solar flares happened for the past solar cycle 24. Okay, so this solar cycle 24 is a total number of flares. And this is a total, this is the year. Green is the number of C class, C3 class, and above. Green is the M class solar flare. X is the X class solar flare. And then uh, ISN is the uh, sunspot number, international sunspot number, annual. Okay, so you will notice that. The, sum, the sunspot number actually correlates very well with the occurrence of flares. But it doesn't mean, again, doesn't mean that the highest flares happen during the solar maximum. In fact, the solar, uh, the, this previous solar flare, this is the largest solar flare in, in the solar, uh, solar cycle 24. It happened during solar mini. Okay, now for your second homework, you you, I want you to remake this figure for the current solar cycle from 20, 2009 to 2019. But this time we're going to include all C class, all M class, and all X class. And then you're going to use the spacer, spaceweatherlive.com data from now. I, later at the end of the class, I will show you how to do homework number two. Or how do we, how do we get this statistics, okay? So again, just uh, uh, just look at the, uh, just uh, graph the total number of layers. Okay, from 2009, 2009 to 2019. Okay. Now, coronal mass ejection. Usually, okay, solar flares are accompanied by coronal mass ejection, but not all the time. Okay. Usually only the large, uh, uh, only the large uh, flares is, a uh, a company, is accompanied by a coronal mass ejection. And then usually solar flare happens first before the ejection of the material or CME. Okay. So for example, this is a CME. So these are some of the CMEs that are, uh, that are recent. Uh, just to give an idea, this is approximate size of the earth. This is a CME. So that's a, that ejection is very large, okay? Uh, so this, uh, the, this top panel is uh, 2013, August. This is 20, uh, 2000, year 2000, solar cycle 23 already in February. Okay, just to give an idea how, does, uh, how do this uh, large CMEs happen. So these are large uh, ejection of, uh, of, of masses, no? Okay, like this one. Okay, so you notice how, so how does this happen? So it starts with a, with an active region. Of course, this is a simplified version of how, what happens now. So, uh, so, so solar, uh, solar uh, sunspots actually come in pairs. So one should be north and the other one is south. Now, as this uh, north and south pole becomes more active. So that means the magnetic intensity or the magnetic field intensity becomes larger. It will start to curve like this. Okay, like this, so it will grow. Now it's not yet ejected at this point. Now you already saw this in the uh, physics of the Aurora that I asked you to take a few, a few weeks ago. No? But the point is that as uh, when the magnetic field line up like this, you will notice that this part of the magnetic field lines will be opposite to this part of the magnetic field lines. Now at this 
uh, this uh, this uh, magnetic loop becomes strong. Okay, this negative this oppositely directed magnetic field will be attracted to this part, and because this happens in a plasma, magnetic reconnection happens. So this X point is where magnetic reconnection happens, and when magnetic reconnection happens, okay. The plasma that will be released will be ejected outward like this. Okay. Okay. So this is well, but this is the general this this is the general idea how general uh, coronal mass ejections are actually generated. Okay. And this is uh, depicted at this picture. So you will notice again. Let me let me go back. So these are your sunspots. So this is your magnetic loop. So you will notice that this magnetic field line is pointing to the to the right. This magnetic field line points to the left. Okay, now if this is increasing, you will notice that this magnetic field line, which is oppositely directed to this magnetic field line, this will eventually attract each other. And then there is there will be a presence of an X point where your magnetic reconnection happens. So this magnetic reconnection will release this plasma contained in this magnetic field. And this is further released like this. So this will now um, this will now move as a big uh, a big cloud of plasma, a very large plasma. In fact, the size of the earth is about this point. So if this is the case, this illustration shows that relative to the earth, this magnetic field line will point to the south. Okay, in the in the context of the Earth, like that. Okay, so this is how a general uh, way how coronal mass ejection happens. Question, sir. Yes. Sir, uh, lagi bang from north to south ang nya ejection nya yung magnetic field ba nyan? Yung magnetic loop nya laging north north to south or nagsa south to north siya? No, uh, the magnetic field line always points from north to south. My magnetic field lines always point north to south. It's always like that. Okay, so wala magnetic field line na mag na mag point from south to north. However, of course, uh, the this orientation is just an oversimplification of what really happens in real time or in real life. No, okay. So because remember, we're going to look at the solar magnetism here. Okay. Some magnet, some some poles will be uh, above the the some poles uh, will be below some uh, some of the uh, the orientation of the sun of the sunspot can be east west north south so it depends on how the sunspots are actually oriented no? so uh, it really depends on uh, how the active regions are uh, would produce this uh, this uh, magnetic field lines. Okay, so it's not always the case. So this this illustration is just a simplification, oversimplification, that if there is a, a sunspot, a, a sunspot sunspot pair that is oriented in the north south direction, and the north pole is here, and the south pole is here, so it will produce a magnetic field line like this, and then it will produce a CME that carries an EMF that is pointing downward. Okay. Natagot ko ba yung tanong mo, Ramon? Yes, yes po, sir. Okay na po. Okay, sige. Okay, now I showed you before. This one, no? I showed you before. This is just, a, you know, your typical solar wind that is happening a few, a few days ago, no? So this is actually created in October 21. Okay, and then uh, October 21, these are the, the data before our, uh, our, our, uh, our measurements and then the day after our, uh, sorry, uh, these are actually model. So the information that was, got, that was gathered 29 in October 19, but the model, uh, this image was modeled in 2020, in uh, October 21. So this is your typical. So this is actually a boring part. Now, what happens if you have a CMT? What does that simulation look like? 
So this is how that simulation would look like. Okay. Now this is for the geomagnetic storm in 2013. This is the St. Patrick's geomagnetic storm. Okay. Uh, this is the A solar wind data. 2016, 2017, and 2018. So you will notice here that uh, the CME happened in 2015, okay? But it arrived at 2017. So how do we know that the CME arrived at 2017? So you will notice here that at, uh, at around this time, the, the CME impacted the Earth at around this time. And by the by the by looking at the solar wind speed, you will notice that this is your background solar wind, or typical 300, 400 meters per second. But once the CM, uh, once the CME impacted the Earth, the sol the speed jumped to 500, and it reached to about 700 kilometers per second at the middle of March 17. So this is an indication that the CME have impacted the Earth because remember the CME is a cloud of plasma and it actually accelerates the background solar wind. Okay, and during this time, okay, you will notice that the, the magnetic field that the CME carries, okay, or the IMF, BZ, suddenly became southward from a normal directed magnetic field by a normal moving solar wind, you will notice that the magnetic field points southward. For a while, then it pointed northward, then again, it pointed southward. Okay, so this this changes actually uh, appeared in the phi, the direction or the the, uh, the angle, uh, and the density also appeared. So you will notice that the the density suddenly decreased. Okay, so this is an indication that when when a, the, uh, that the uh, ge uh, a geomagnetic storm will happen, because this south pointing magnetic field carried by the CME will actually interact with the north pointing uh, magnetic field by the earth, especially in the equator. Okay, and you will notice also that the plasma temperature also increased during this time. So this is actually when, uh, this is a CME data. Okay, now what happens here is this is a simulation. So again, blue and the upper part means low plasma density, Green means higher plasma density. You will notice here that the radial speed is already fast, about uh, as low as only about 300. Green, a uh, yellow is about 500. Orange is about 600. Okay, so if you're going to play this one. Okay, so you will notice that this is uh, the ejection of the solar wind. So again, if you're going to look at that. So this at this time, very tiny part. This is the uh, the CME that was ejected from the sun. So you will notice that it actually impacted the background solar wind. So this is a background solar wind, and then there is that coronal mass ejection. Okay. So the radial speed of this coronal mass ejection reached about more than uh, 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 around uh, below uh, nine hundred. In fact, it reach about 700 here. Okay, so this is the cloud. This is the cloud. So you will notice that the cloud actually points, in this case, and the uh, toward the, the this direction. Okay, so it is directed at toward the uh, facing the Earth from the sun, left of the Earth. So it will gray. It 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 will hit mostly should uh, should uh, hit the earth at the left side of the earth fa uh, facing the earth from the sun. If we're going to look at the north south, it will hit downward about around around below. Okay. So if we're going to look at this, you will notice that the CME is expanding. This is the density again. The CME is expanding, but the CME reduced speed because the CME actually slows down. Okay, if you're going to look at before, you will notice that there, the, initially the speed of the CM is about 900, very fast, and then it eventually slowed down as it expands. Okay, and then by March 17, it will almost hit the Earth. And then at this time, this cloud of plasma 
you will, so you will notice no uh, there are two bright spots so meron kang dalawang there are two fast moving solar wind uh, fast moving uh, cme so that's probably why there are two times that, that there are two times that uh, uh, there was two south uh, there were two instances that uh, that the imf interplanetary magnetic field pointed southward okay so you will notice here that uh, by this prediction, this is actually a prediction, it's a model, that it will definitely hit at around 17, uh, about 17 and a half UT, no? 17 and a half UT. So a bit late, a few minutes late than this one, but definitely just before, just after, uh, just after uh, March 17, it actually hit the Earth. Okay, so this is your, uh, just to complete, so you will notice that the plasma density, uh, uh, this CME actually passed by a very brief period of time. So the radial velocity, because it accelerates the background solar wind, it still fasts. So that's why here, even after the heat of the CME, the, the, the solar wind speed will still be very fast based on measurement. This is model, okay? We're going to advance it again. Okay, and you will notice that the Earth actually dissipates. And the CME dissipates. Dissipated on it. Okay, so this prediction was created in March 16, one day before the CME impacted the Earth. Okay. So this is an example of your uh, solar wind uh, and CME, you know, data. Okay, Question this is just sir. 2015, no? Yes? Sir, di ba yung mga uh, solar, solar wind is nag-dissipate? Uh, Umaabot ko ba naman, siya sa... Di, di, di. Ang solar wind di nag-dissipate, it's always there. It's your background. Uh, the, it's, it's a continuous CME stream. Po. Ang CME yung nag, nag-dissipate. Uh. Okay, umaabot po ba siya, sir, sa ibang ano pa, uh, sa... For mga far planet like Jupiter, Saturn. Yes, yes, or... yes, yes, yes. I actually I I watched a, a lecture a few days ago, wherein uh, these people were asked to were asked by by NASA people to predict solar wind and uh, solar wind uh, or solar weather in term uh, basically solar wind in IMF. Uh, up, uh, once the I don't know the horizon satellite. Reaches, I don't know, reaches the planet Pluto. So they, the the horizons people ask the space weather prediction center what will be the space weather once the horizon satellite actually hits Earth, uh, hits uh, or arrives at Pluto. So they also use the same. You know, so they will see whether the solar wind, this fast moving solar wind, especially during, ngayon, no, for example, ngayon na. Uh, uh, there are uh, corona holes, there are large corona holes. Okay, so those are continuous stream, no? And because that's very fast, it's called continuous. So it actually reaches at the farthest reaches of the solar system. Okay, so this is uh, this uh, this simulation can be extended to ano, to the simulation can be extended to 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 outer reaches of the solar system. And because of the fact that number one, solar wind is still fast at the Oslo at those times. And then if CME happens, and if the CME is very large and very fast at the start, it can actually reach the outer planets now, at least the orbits of the outer planets. It doesn't necessarily mean that it will reach the planets themselves. Thank you. Yeah, so it, 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 Okay, sige. Now, let's go to uh, the latest space weather. No? Uh, this is just a few days ago. So because I, you remember, no, uh, there, was a, uh, there was a corona hole before. And then it's supposed to be heat. Uh, uh, yeah, it's supposed to be heat, no, the 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 Earth a few days ago. And then we also have a, a small solar storm during this 
uh, in this active region on 2776. So this was photographed uh, October 19. Okay. Uh, so there was a deeming of this region. Okay. Because remember, when there is a solar storm, there is a an eruption. So there is a, there will be a tear or mapupunit yung solar surface because of the ejection. A very a very small uh, ejection, and it happens to be in the strike zone of the Earth. Okay, when they look at this part. Now, what happens here is that, okay. So it, it mentioned here by Dr. Skov that we could have an impact by October 23, Ayan, no? today. And indeed, no, I just uh, obtained this a few hours ago and it, in, in, and it did happen. No? Uh, so for example, this is your BZ. Uh, this, is, uh, this is solar wind data coming from discovered uh, spacecraft, but this only for quick look plots, not science quality. Uh, okay, so, so what happens here is this one. So this is the magnetic field. So red is busy. So at this moment, there was a southward pointing magnetic field. So naturally, the ring current will, the, the Earth's magnetic field will weaken, will, uh, will, uh, no, no, will strengthen and then weaken later and then uh, recover later. So that's a usual, I don't know, usual path or usual uh, uh, usual procedure or usual thing that happens. Okay, now the the, the solar wind carries this uh, high density plasma, but this high density plasma is not uh, the magnetic field is pointing sa, uh, northward. No? So uh, during this time, there's no geomagnetic storm. But even if this passes, this dissipates, as long as the magnetic field is low, there will be a geomagnetic storm. You will notice at this point, solar wind increases, plasma temperature increases. Okay? And consequently, you will see that there's a geomagnetic storm currently happening. So this is a, this is a KP index. This is a geomagnetic index. This basically tells you if there is a storm or not. Okay? We, we're going to talk about this more later in the coming days. But basically, KP is an index that tells you if there is a disturbance in the geomagnetic field. So higher values of K, KP, means there is a geomagnetic storm. Another geomagnetic storm index that we use is called the DST index. This is disturbance storm time. This is a real-time data uh, provided by the World Data Center for Geomagnetism in Kyoto University in Japan. So you will notice here, this is actually, I, I obtained this a few hours ago, okay? Uh, this, this is a signature of a geomagnetic storm, okay? This is just a starting, no? I will not, uh, I will just show you later how uh, DSD for a whole storm would look like. But the point is that uh, during a geomagnetic storm, uh, there are three phases. The first phase is the sudden commencement. So that means there's a sudden increase in the magnetic field. This is magnetic field. Okay. Once this hits, now and then, uh, because once it hits, it, the magnetic field increases suddenly and then it will weaken because of the reconnection, diba? Right? When there's reconnection, the magnetic field and that region will weaken because of the ejection of the energy. There is a magnetic energy ejection during magnetic reconnection. So the point is that right now we are in the main phase. So this will continue to slow down until this storm is uh, stops or passes, passes through. Now, when it passes through, the magnetic field of the Earth will start to, uh, will start to, uh, yeah, will start to uh, recover now. It would look something like this. So sudden commencement, then main phase and it will start to recover like that okay so this is a normal uh, geomagnetic field and this is what a geomagnetic storm would look like okay once it is hit by a let's say a fast moving solar wind or a uh, or a cme 
Okay. Okay. So this is the latest space weather that uh, that are is happening right now, and then in the next meeting we're going to uh, put all the things that we talked about today. Uh, uh, by having a a data visualization and uh, data access uh, activity. So right at next week, I will go in to teach you where do we get data, how do we usually you know uh, uh, get this data, X-ray flux. We're going to focus on two things: solar flare data and solar wind data, because these are very important in uh, in determining uh, solar. Uh, uh, space weather activity because these are the drivers now because my field is actually the my field is uh, ionosphere so what uh, we look at uh, I always look at the ionosphere how how it changes over time uh, what are the transient uh, activities there like, like was there a plasma bubble or whatever and then once I observe something Okay, once I observe something there, uh, I look at the space, uh, space weather uh, data, for example, a solar wind. I look at the solar wind. What, what happened to the solar wind that caused this object? Was there a flare? Was there, geom was there a geomagnetic storm? Uh, so I'm looking, I, I usually look at the drivers of uh, uh, solar drivers and geomagnetic drivers to explain what happens. Uh, if there was a phenomenon that happened in the ionosphere, okay. Uh, other than that, for example, well, uh, uh, there is no geomagnetic storm. There are no, you know, there's no special activity that happened in the sun that reaches the earth. There's no solar flare. There's no CME. There's no high uh, fast stream solar wind. Whatever. I look at different sources. So I have a student who look who looks who would look like who would look uh, who will look at uh, ionospheric signatures uh, days before an earthquake. So yes, it can happen. No? Uh, the ionosphere can also be. There are a lot of you know observations that showed that uh, the ionosphere can be used as an earthquake precursor no? uh, for for to to look at the what happens before earthquakes. And hopefully, uh, this is a young field, and hopefully, this would eventually lead up to you know some kind of an earthquake prediction. But I think it's it will still be a very long, uh, very long way to go. But the, the the field is very promising, so that's one of the things that my my students are working on. Uh, two of my students before have worked on the geomagnetic storm in St. Patrick's Day and the solar flare X-ray flux. We already did some work in this. We look at the how the GPS position for GPS satellite uh, for GPS receivers were affected by this X-ray flux by this X-ray uh, by this uh, solar flare in 2017. So we look at so we saw a degradation in the solar in the positioning error in the position uh, there was a deg degradation in the positioning accuracy of GPS during that time. So that's very important because, for example, we're going to use high precision positioning, let's say, during, uh, for example, for automated farming, for self-driving cars. Uh, so every centimeter of error in the in the in, in position would greatly affect what happens to that to those I don't know, to those uh, in for, for to those in technologies. So that's why it's very important to. To look at uh, space weather, especially now uh, uh, we are already in the start of a new solar cycle. So these activities, these solar flares, the CMEs will become more frequent as as year progresses, and it it will peak at around five years, six years from now. Uh, so by the time maybe there will be more space assets owned by the Philippines. So it's more imperative to to protect this. Uh, Protect this sat, uh, protect this uh, space assets from uh, space weather and uh, space weather hazards. Okay, so that's it. That that's our class today. Uh, questions? Yeah.
Okay, question ko na check. bago natin uh, bago ko sagot bago ko uh, bago kayo tulungan uh, before I help you uh, before I help you 